And we're back on Fresh Waves. I'm trying to make an effort to say and, or not to say the and, because we don't really need it. We are back on Fresh Waves. <laughs> I'm talking with Cheryl McLean, who's the author and the writer of Good, Good Grief. This is the one I should be watching my grammar with. Um, let's talk a little bit about writing itself. Let's okay. talk about language. I was mm. actually thinking yesterday that there is a lot of um, frivolly writing sometimes that I don't like personally. Mm-hmm. And language is, you know, all of a sudden you've got this crime detective story going on with all this violence and and then the next chapter talks about how long the person has been missing for, followed by, and the sun played peekaboo with the clouds in the sky. Um, <laughs> what? What? Hang on a second. Let's go back to that. What? Is that that piece of descriptive writing that you threw in there just because you're supposed to? I don't get it. The sun played peekaboo with the clouds in the sky. In a million trillion years, I would never say something like that. Although I know that it's, you know, part of that writing 101-3. But... Throw in some description. I don't know. I think this was before your time at Toastmasters. Uh Uh-huh. We... I did a workshop on the difference between spoken language and written language. Yes. Huge difference, isn't there? Huge difference. So I was always saying, you know, if you write your speeches and then you read them, they sound very remote. Mm-hmm. You have to write differently to speak than you do in writing. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the things that we uh, think about in writing is about the cadence. Or I don't even know if you think about those things. It comes through as a voice and a natural way of your writing sounding just like my nose my <laughs> my nose is nasally my voice is nasally and i know that um and my writing voice is a certain way i can't really describe it and i know that mm-hmm. um i use lots of thirds so this this and this or i'm using descriptors, adjectives, also known as... And like Trump's very, 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 very? <laughs> well, no, that's four. <laughs> I would just use very, very, very. Uh, <laughs> no, you wouldn't. No. Uh, very, really, extremely. No, I awesome. wouldn't do that. Uh, but <laughs> she's trying not to have her, her hands come and cover her face. She hates that word. Yes. <laughs> Um, actually, in technical writing, at one point we had had uh, a, a product project manager had wanted us to say something was very, very important. I'm like, no, that's why you use the the yellow the the caution box that points out what is in this box is already very important, and you do not put very, very. In any piece of technical writing, um, I don't think it really goes in any piece of writing. But anyway, speech for that matter. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There's better ways to say that. But yeah, uh, the way you write is different from the way we speak, and what comes out when you write is unique to an individual. And uh, I kind of forget the question now. Well, we were just talking about language <laughs> and the use of language. And in writing, it's... Oh, um, the clouds playing pookaboo with the yeah. sun. Yeah. Yeah, that that may have just been thrown in. Um, and sometimes we do little things like that to get us into our writing. It, it's an exercise. So you would take... That your editor should have removed before it went to hard copy? Oh, yeah. I'm just thinking. <laughs> Yeah, because you have to have a voice that is consistent with the theme and the 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 overall writing all mm-hmm. has to be cons- consistent. So if you are, you know, a, a very, very plain language writer... Add another very just for fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> did I say that? Yes, yes did. I did. Are you, if you are a plain language writer, then you shouldn't be throwing in little... Things like that, because people are reading, and part of the contract that you have with a reader when you're a writer is to say, okay, this is how I write, and we're going to be consistent. So the reader says, okay, this is great. I like this flow of writing. I can, I either, you know, there's some writing that you really have to work hard to read. Mm -hmm. It can be beautiful. 
it can be very beautiful. I'm thinking of highly literary writing where you're really, you have to really get into it and mm-hmm. you have to let it envelop you. Even a Tolkien book. Oh, and people okay. are so into uh, watching the movies. When you sit down to actually read The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings, it's written in a very different English and you really have to make an effort at first to get into the flow of that writing. Yes, and sometimes you have to make an effort throughout that writing to stay into it. Uh, story be damned. It's, there's mm-hmm. some books you can't get through. Um, other ones, like you were saying, a crime or detective novel is tends to be a faster pace, more, let's say, commercial. And suspenseful and all that Suspenseful, kind of stuff. but that relies on very simple writing mm-hmm. and very... Which isn't easy to do. Let me just simple no, writing not. is not simple to write. No, I'm, and I'm not saying anything about the writing of that. Um, but, but then the conversation that's in that writing is the spoken word that we were discussing. So this, you don't write like you speak, but when you're writing a conversation, you kind of have to write like you speak or it stands out. You know, you've got a character who you've just described as being a, a real blue collar worker who is, um, living a very simple life and, you know, Campbell soup and g- grilled cheese sandwiches for dinner. And that's, a, that's a highlight of the day kind of thing. Yep. And then he uses, um, celestial words that are huge and long and you would know for sure they would never say those words in right. regular speech. Right. But yeah. So you're <coughs> excuse me. That's all a thing about having your characters consistent as well. Right. Like everything in your story has to be consistent to make it easy on the reader to read what he's or she has said, okay, this is what I want to write. Thank you for writing it. Um, but you have to deliver on that contract. And the reader, if they're right, it, reading something that they've been promised is something easy and flowy to read and just really, you know, stick to the facts, ma'am, which is where a crime and detective novel would generally kind of get its voice. Right. Um, then to have, you know, the clouds playing peekaboo and the, you know, it's, it's not consistent with that and it throws you out. That's where I was going with all this. It you does. don't want to get thrown out. It threw you out of the novel for a minute because it was jarring. It was actually jarring. Mm-hmm. Especially because I was doing it in talking book form. So it's being read to you and then it's, wow, it really, it really just stuck out. That happened this morning, which is why it's kind of okay. on my mind. And equally though, so, Although you have to have a dialogue and a description that sort of fits the mood of the of the story that you're telling. Mm-hmm. When you have something like, remember the book Shiloh that a lot of kids read when they were in grade school? It's, a, it's about a little boy and his dog, or a dog that he rescues, and they're in the, the far south. And the whole book is written with a southern accent, like y'all and mm-hmm. all the colloquials. It's very accurately done, but it's difficult as heck to read. Unless you're from there. Unless you're from there. <laughs> but, you know. I have a lot of friends from down there now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, that's the way they speak. So, uh, that to them would be very accessible. Right. So, uh, everything is, and that's another thing that, you know, when I was saying you make this contract with the reader and writer. So the writer's going into it knowing that, okay, this isn't just first page for a fax. This is how this book is written. So I'm either on board with it or I'm not. Right. And to not be on board with it is fine. Not every book is written for every person. That's true. So when you've got your ideas and your books and your language under control and you're you're heading down to Costa Rica just to bring it back to any writing mm-hmm. retreat. Doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily have to be Costa Rica. It could be anywhere in the world. Yeah. It could be in the Arctic if that's where you choose to go and get away for There's some lovely ones in Alaska actually. I can imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, does the place where you're at influence the work that you are doing? Or is it mostly a mental place where you're writing as opposed to a physical place? Hmm. That's a very good question. And I think it will depend on the individual. Yeah. For me, once I'm working on something and once I'm deep into that, um, some of the two, one of the tools that I rely heavily on is music. Hmm. And so 
<coughs> different things that I've written have different music that I play while I'm writing. Okay. So there's a there's a feel. So my one book that I was writing and I was having a hard time really getting into it every time I sat down and I had <clears throat> a Carly Rae Jepsen CD which she's kind of light and uh, her voice is light and airy and the music is kind of upbeat and sweet and it was the perfect music for that character <coughs> excuse me so that helped me get in uh, another thing that I was writing every time I was going to my writing classes and stuff, I was just listening to this classical guitar, which became kind of the soundtrack for the entire book that I wrote. Um, so every, everything for me, um, or my experience, my, my process, I guess, has been more around sound than um, a physical environment that I'm looking at or feeling. Um, I also, uh, my my weaker point of my writing is setting. So perhaps that tells you something. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not terribly influenced by setting and I'm not good at putting setting into my story, that's one thing that never gets in there on first draft, and I have to go back and really, I feel like I'm manipulating it in, and the feedback I get is that it's done quite seamlessly, mm -hmm. but I feel like I'm putting it there. Imposing that. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you are a person that is highly affected by environment and setting, mm -hmm. then uh, yes, where you go may have a big difference. And um, like the question about, you know, how can I write about a snowy day? If you're really writing an entire novel about being stuck, um, you know, in the Antarctic ice, well, you might want to go to Antarctica to write that, or at least to sketch that out, because it's going to be a very different experience. Um, but then, you know, the setting is part of the character of that book. Mm -hmm. It's a, basically a character in the book. It's it it affects everything in the book. Whereas, you know, if you're just writing something that moves around or that. Mm, can be kind of anywhere, but it happens to be set, say, in Minneapolis, or it happens to be set in Georgia or Toronto. Uh, but it could happen anywhere. Then you're less reliant on the ambient setting around you. Okay, that makes sense. We have to okay. take a break. We'll be back right after this quick commercial break. You're listening to Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. We're speaking with Cheryl from Costa Rica, Casa Mizmac. Yeah, I'm whistling at you. We at Whistle FM are always looking for new volunteers. Ever thought of producing a show or hosting your own show or maybe just helping out around the office? We could use your help and you could become part of your community radio station. Drop us a line at admin at whistleradio.com or come by the station. We are located in the basement of Stillville Fine Furniture. See you soon. Hi, folks. Kim Mitchell here. You know, however you choose to get around your ATV, your snowmobile, your boat, car, if you have a motorcycle, all these things take 100% of your attention and skill to operate safely. Alcohol impairs that, and bad things can happen. So, be smart, okay? You know what I'm going to say next. This message brought to you from the Safe and Sober Awareness Committee. And we're back on Fresh Waves. There's that and again. See, this is what happens when you have a show with an author. You're oh. trying to use your best grammar and you mess it up every time. Anyway, we're talking about why you would even go to a writing in residence. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the fact that it could be really anywhere. Is there some truth to the fact that when you're at a writing in residence, the uh, if you read 
some of the new information on neuroplasticity and the way the brain works and the habits that we have in our lives. When you take yourself out of your normal setting, your brain acts differently. It, okay. it, it's not, it doesn't have the same triggers around mm -hmm. it. it. It can clear itself. People go on vacation a lot of times to clear their heads. Vacation brain, yes. Right. But if you're going on a writing thing where your intention is to write something, mm -hmm. and then you go to a place like Chasm Ismac, a writer's in residence, there are many of them around the world. Mm -hmm. It's actually not so much a, f it's a physical change, but it's also a mental change, which can help Absolutely. you unblock a writer's block or a creative block. Yes, because you don't have all those other little things on your on your plate, let's say. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking about, oh, what time do I have to get dinner on the table? Uh, I need to do laundry before the kids come home. What are the kids going to wear tomorrow? Uh, what do I have to do for my husband? Or, or, you know, whose weekend is it? Or... Any of those things, or I have right. to drive myself to here and then get to there, and I got to get these three things done all before five thirty, and no, that all goes away, right? Because your intention is this block of time that you've set aside mm -hmm. to work on your writing. Yes, now, but okay, I was going to say uh, but too. Okay, so you go first. Sometimes you block off, and I've done this. Oh, I'm going to have a self-imposed writing retreat for the next couple of days, and all of a sudden that just. Whoosh, it throws you right out. Yeah, because somebody comes and says, hey, you want to go to the coffee plantation? You're like, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, but but there's also this uh, psychological thing that happens because all of a sudden you're putting so much pressure on yourself. So what, and I get this, so uh, I've been going to uh, writer Sanctuary days at uh, uh, Inkslinger's. Uh, by Sue and James, sorry, Sue Reynolds and James Stewart, for many, many years. And their thing is just work on what you're working on. And really, if if you need to take a nap, or you yeah. need to go for yeah. a walk, or you need to, you know, look at your foot and figure out why you have this, you know, strange little thing growing off your toenail. I don't know, whatever. Ew, uh, that was nicely descriptive. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. It, it's your time to do what you need to do. And as much as, you know, my idea is, oh, come here and work on your writing. Sometimes that doesn't work for everyone. Mm -hmm. Come here and work on your writing has a lot of shoulds attached to it. It's got a lot of pressure attached to it. So come here with the intention of working on your writing. And if that doesn't quite go as you would like it to go, be kind and open and gentle with yourself to say, what do I need in this moment? So is that where you as a host comes into play? Not that you're there to necessarily, I mean, there should be a definition between the writers in residence and a workshop. A workshop mm -hmm. is come and let's work on technique, let's work on description, let's work on writing and writing mm -hmm. skills versus come and write. Yeah. But guess own. what? I'm also an author. Yes. I have a lot of experience with writing and writing scenarios. Mm -hmm. So I'm here if you need me. Yes, I'm also a writing coach, so right. that helps. Uh, people also who come get a one-hour meeting, let's say, with me. It's not really a meeting. It's a sit and chat about your writing. Um, so I can, and I also, I'm open to uh, having, you know, a one-hour session in the morning with anybody who's there who cares to join to have a prompt. Um, in the AWA, which is Amherst Writers and Artists, uh, method, you uh, get together, you have prompted writing. So you write for 10 minutes based on a prompt, or you can go rogue and write something completely different, whatever you want to mm -hmm. write. And then we share this raw, brand new writing. And it's not to say, oh my God, why are you writing about that? Or, you know, to give any critical feedback because truth be told, this person who wrote that has not even read it. So right. you can't give any critical feedback because 
they haven't had a chance to look just, at it critically themselves. Yeah, it's just like blabbed out onto the page. Yeah. And generally, you don't realize what you've written. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to it in a week, it's going to sound differently. But you just, you share what you've written. And people say what's stuck with them, what they like, what's already working in that. And that can serve as a springboard. Mm -hmm. So in the mornings, because I'm there writing as well, I'm perfectly happy to do prompted writing and, uh, you know, get, get something started, get something flowing. Uh, same thing with the afternoon, get together, everybody writes down something and then you've either inspired yourself or somebody, something somebody else has written in response mm -hmm. to that prompt kind of goes, Ooh, wait a second. That's a really kind of cool take on that. And that's, you know, my, I can put my, writer in that or not my writer my character in that situation and in that way you're not stealing from the person because you're not taking what they've written or anything you're just um springboarding off of their mm -hmm. springboard basically um so uh, there's there's so many ideas that can come up um when you're writing in a group mm -hmm. and you're sharing your writing that wouldn't come up in another way. So, and that's why I really had a hard time with whether it's a writing retreat or a writer's residence or a self-directed writing retreat. So I'm kind of between writer's residence and self-directed writing retreat. Um, and I will also be offering some uh, very small writing retreats. So, you know, six people, and mm -hmm. uh, 10 days intensive, really get some work done. So, yeah. 10 days intensive. That sounds like an awfully long time. Mm. I mean, a lot of good I did one that. of your three-day courses, and it was really fun. Mm. I really enjoyed it. Got some really cool writing. And a couple of yep. good lines that I must say I'll keep in my little list of good lines. Yes. <laughs> but then when you're doing a longer retreat... You'd be writing together in the mornings only, not oh, right. a full day. Right. Where when we were doing it, we were really putting in as much as we could put in. Right. And because of the time constraint. Exactly. So doing morning and afternoon. So it gives you a lot more freedom to work on what you're already working on. Um, and just kind of get into it with the morning writing. And then in the afternoon, you're, you're in that writing mode and you're just deep, deep into it. Okay. Now, I, we're running out of time, as we always do, but um, when you're becoming an author of a story that is not necessarily just your story, mm -hmm. or even if it is the story of your story, the characters around your story are really important. Mm -hmm. Do you find that it actually makes you take a look at the world in a... And under a microscope kind of thing, because you're, you're looking at people more closely. You're not just oh. looking at the way they look for a description. They actually have a personality. They actually have a part in your life or yes. in your novel. Yeah, I, I'm very interested in psychology, always have been, and motivations, why people do the things they do, and how many times people do something and you're just like, oh my God, seriously, no, 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 no. But no, why did you do that? Mm -hmm. But there's always a reason behind it. And there's always, it's, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, and at the time, and the good idea are tied to all of your past experience. Mm -hmm. And you either are doing things the same over and over, expecting a different result, or you're... Isn't that the definition of insanity? Uh-huh. Yeah. Or you're trying to do something different. And sometimes the doing something different, you get the same result as well. That's true. How and thoroughly depressing is that? Yeah. <laughs> so, so to look at motivations and why people do the things they do and how they go about doing them and how people change. Fundamentally, in the end, it's how does somebody come to a realization and make a fundamental change? That, to me, is the crux of any really good novel. 
in in my genre. I write mm-hmm. women's fiction. I write about how we evolve as a person and go from what's not working to what is working. Which isn't to say it's going to work forever. It no. means that it's a change and it'll work for now. Mm-hmm. So psychology and understanding people. And that's... Some people think I'm a little too lenient on people. I'm a little too trusting. I'm a little too nice. But I always think maybe maybe this time. Maybe this time will be the time that they make that change that they know they have to make. Maybe. In fiction, it works. Yes, and as a re- as a reader of fiction, I often think I know what's going to happen at the end, halfway through the book. But my thrill with reading it is to find out how they're going to get there. The process. I yes. love it. I love uh-huh. it. I'm all about the process. Anyway, we're out of time. No. It's been wonderful. Great. Best of luck with Casa Mismac. I hope Thank to you. come and visit you again. Thank you. And... Um, For anyone who wants to get a hold of you, they can just go to freshwaves.ca, drop me a little message, and I will put them in touch with the mistress of Casa Mismac. Or casamismac.com. Or on Facebook, Casa Mismac. Perfect. And then you can see some pictures and everything, too. Mm -hmm. There you go. Thanks, Jay, for all your work behind the boards. Thanks, Jennifer, for helping (laughs) us out this morning. We've had a wonderful, wonderful couple of hours here on Fresh Waves. If you want to hear any of our shows, go to freshwaves.ca and check out the podcasts. Have a great day, everyone. Be kind to one another and be kind to everything you see. See you next time on Fresh Waves been listening to Fresh Waves, a Whistle FM production. I'm your host, Brenda Masson, and our technical producer is Jason Rumball. Tune in every Wednesday at 10 a.m. for Fresh Waves here on Whistle FM, 102.9 on the FM dial and whistlefm.com anywhere in the world. Fresh Waves is available on podcast too. Just go to whistlefm.ca or freshwaves.ca. We podcast all of the Fresh Waves shows so that you can listen at your leisure. Fresh Waves, it really is 